My name is Mark Kroll. This is my first time on pulpit. I am part of a class of soon to be graduated practitioners. Nikki's here with me, Brenda's on Zoom, and I know Luana is with us in spirit. We have been so ably supported by Reverend Sidney, Dr. Mark, and everybody here. So thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity. I am, my heart is like bursting with joy at this opportunity. So welcome to the Wednesday service. And uh, not only the folks that are here in person, and I see many friendly faces, no unfriendly faces, <laughs> and also welcome to everybody that's joining us virtually through Zoom and Facebook. As you know that for the Wednesday service, we do, we begin the service with a pre-service meditation. So I invite you all to get still and close your eyes and prepare for the meditation. We will be playing God is the love that I am chant. And so if that's comfortable for you, go ahead and repeat that chant to yourself. If you have a different mantra, use that, a different chant, or just pay attention to the breath and allow that spirit of God to just commune with you for these 10 minutes. I'll keep track of the time and we'll call us back. <laughs>
And so as our meditation comes to a close, gently bring your awareness back into your surroundings, into your bodies. And as you feel ready, open your eyes. Welcome again, for those of you that have just joined us, to the Wednesday evening service. My name is Mark Kroll, and I am so thrilled and over the moon to be with you tonight. Um, we're so glad that you've been able to join us virtually or in person. And a quick reminder for those of you that have joined us in person, if you could please make sure your devices are turned off or on silent mode. Thank you very much. We have now our musician ministry with Sam and Gia. <laughs> Now let's join together in prayer. God is indeed in this place. There is only one power. That power is God, the creator, absolutely with those qualities of love and light and spirit and wholeness, perfection, peace and grace. This is the truth of who and what we are. This is the truth of the universe. And it can be found in every aspect of the universe, every experience in the universe, every person here and every person on the planet. I know that I'm an individuation of that power, that presence, and all of those qualities of God reside within me. And they reside within everyone here, everyone participating in the service tonight. So I know and I declare that our time together is blessed and so very blessed, that we are made better, we are made smarter, we are more loving as a result of coming together whenever the two or more are gathered, that we are inspired by the message and the dialogue and the discussion from Reverend Sidney, and that we are elevated in consciousness together. And it is so rich, it is so thrilling, it is just so beautiful. I'm so grateful and thankful for our time together. I'm so grateful and thankful for everyone at this church. I'm so grateful for this teaching and have, for having found this teaching. I'm so grateful for this practitioner path that I've been on. I'm so grateful for our time together. So with a heart full of joy and gratitude, I release my word into the law of mind, knowing it is so, knowing it is done. And so together we say, amen. So now if you would please Join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. When you're weary and feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I will dry them all. Be high, love. 
is your Am I on? I am. Okay. So I chose this title tonight in sort of a lighthearted, whimsical fashion. The title is um, Spiritual Overdraft Protection. And I thought, well, that's because I've, I've used that title before. My talks are always different. I do reuse my title sometimes because sometimes I just think they're really fun and allow me to go someplace with them. Um, and then yesterday, there was a mass shooting. Now, the idea of spiritual overdraft protection is really about the idea that we talk about a lot in New Thought, which is stay prayed up. So in other words, don't waste, wait till the last minute and, and start hoping that God on a white horse is going to come in and rescue you or save you but that you can, little by little, breath by breath, prayer by prayer, choice by choice, build your consciousness, your awareness of the presence of God, your, your knowing of love, your knowing of yourself as a creation of spirit. And if we don't do that, then we find ourselves hearing about events in the world, and we get taken out by them. I did not expect to be having this talk tonight. Um, you know, in, in my office here, I have 11 different Bibles. I have probably seven textbooks from the science of mine. Um, I have, at home, I have copies of the Quran. I have the Kabbalah. I have Torah. I have all of that. And in none of them, and believe me, I've looked, can you open to an index and find readings for a mass shooting. It can't be done. And yet, as I was telling Sam earlier, in my other life as a music director, I did have a file of songs for mass shootings, which is just appalling, isn't it? And yet, there's more here to know. There's more to be revealed. And that's that, and this is right from Gene Houston, crisis drives evolution. Crisis drives evolution. And I'm just going to read a little bit of what she has to say about that. And it just, it, it's really, it's powerful. Whew. So, the heart of the world is calling for you with your special gifts and unique perspectives. What can you do? What will you do? If each person does something, the whole planet will shift. Sit quietly with your authentic heart and ask the question. It is no accident that you are here at this time. What draws you? And we are here together. I really believe we made an agreement with spirit to be here at this time, at this place, to show up not 10 years later, not 10 years earlier, but here so that with all of the people around us and the circumstances where we find ourselves in, so that we could give voice to a greater idea of love, of possibility, and peace. And that's why I'm so glad that Mark agreed to sit with me tonight He's here for moral support, but actually he speaks, as you, can, as you heard, and he's really, really wise. And yeah, you can applaud that, yes. And as a practitioner student, I mean, he's just like mere moments away. We have four wonderfully brilliant lights, shining lights. There's another one over there behind the camera. They are mere minutes away, really, from being, becoming full, fully licensed practitioners. So I wanted to talk about what that means within the context 
of what has happened in this world and to offer, uh, well, context, if that can even be done. But just as, a, as, a, uh, as an aside, when, you, when I first became a practitioner, and I've told this in class, the very first time I got to pray with someone, she came to me, and, and this is the very first time, you know, we have our minute miracles, and the very first time I sat down with someone, she had just received a terminal diagnosis from her doctor. That was the first person, and with all of my nerves and my, how do I go to this presence of God, how do I do that? And it was not too long after that, that 9-11 happened. So, as I've told our students numerous times, we were all going to have our 9-11s. And that's why it is so vital that we have a spiritual practice that we can turn to, we can rely on, so that we don't get taken out, so that we don't fall apart, and so that we don't end up being part of the, um, the collateral damage of whatever has gone on, so that we can actually rise up from that crisis and be part of the evolution, and be part of that loving solution and the growth and the expansion of love on this planet. Does that make sense? All right. So, welcome to your 9-11. Can I, can I offer something? Please, go for it. So, have, having just been on this practitioner training path, one of the things that I had to work on, I think is described as a spiritual bypass, like I was guilty of spiritual bypass. The whole idea of just, I know what the concept is supposed to be, like, this, you know, with a 9-11, with a mass shooting, I know the truth that we're all whole, perfect, and complete. No one ever dies, et cetera, et cetera. So I just go there. But I think, um, like today, I've just been incredibly sad. Yeah. And one of the things I learned in practitioner training is we, we can't deny that. We have to get into that in order to get through it. Mm -hmm. Reverend Sidney, what did you say? You have to break down to break out to break through. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean... I'm, uh, I've had plenty of experiences during my practitioner uh, training that have allowed, that's allowed me to break down, you know, deaths in the family and my own health issues. And again, I just think they're all gifts from God, but they're not all like Pollyanna up here. You know, you, you kind of have to, you have to live it in order to move yeah. Uh, through it. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. You know, and they're not always gifts some, from God. Um, it doesn't look like that. They're not wrapped up in pretty packages with pretty bows. I mean, I'm thinking of where Elizabeth Taylor once was, I, I referenced this the other night in our class, where, where she was interviewed and she was asked, how did you make it through all of the nonsense that you went through, all of the stuff that you suffered through, and all of the, the um, we'll call it fertilizer, that you had to deal with? And she said, you know, I just knew with all of that, fertilizer, and not the word she used, there had to be a pony in there someplace. <laughs> and so we find ourselves more and more looking for a pony. And I think the pony is in the shape of each of us reaching out to each other and offering compassion and support and not doing that bypass. So what are the ways that you have encouraged yourself to not bypass? What have you done? I mean. I think part of it is just give permission to, to feel. And again, in my last, we're required to have a, I mean, we're encouraged to do plenty of practitioner sessions, but one of our requirements is each term we're supposed to have a formal, full-on practitioner session. And so I've had six. And the one I met, the person I met with just last week, she said, you know, you just, uh, you have to give yourself permission. You have to be, you have to be willing. Uh, because it's the only way that, you'll, that you will have the depth yeah. that, will, uh, that will grow from that, the yeah. spiritual depth that, that will yeah. grow with it. And so it's just becoming more comfortable, you know, as a part of, part of what I had to go through is, you know, it's my experience. I was like a typical guy, but I was very sort of sensitive as a child and I used to cry and I remember I, I was, raised Catholic, and I remember in third grade, Sister Marjorie in one of the parent-teacher conferences, she and my mom were talking, and she just did this gesture, like, Mark, you know, he, <gasps> oh. 
and I saw it. You know, I was witness to it. So I ain't going to cry anymore. You know, I was shamed by the nun. Yeah. And so, and men, you know, I'm relying on a stereotype. Men in our culture are often encouraged to just suck it up. Yeah. Women too, but... Man up. Man up, yeah. you know. And so it's years, decades of learning that. And so I'm just patient with myself, knowing, okay, I'm unlearning, uh, but I'm going to be okay with it. And I've gotten permission. Uh, you know, I gave myself permission, and everybody that's been supporting us as practitioner students has given us permission. Because, again, it is, it's the truth of how you can actually grow in depth. You know, I, I was a pretty sensitive, compassionate person, but the depth to which I demonstrate those God qualities right now, it's just so deeper, so much deeper, so much richer as a result of giving myself yeah. permission to do that. Wow, thank you. Um, I'm thinking that there might be a few people here who don't really know what a practitioner does or what a practitioner is for, you know? Is that someone who um, adjusts your back or, or <laughs> sticks needles in you or, or, you know, does animal sacrifice? None of the above. Although most of our practitioners have other have vocations, and practicing is an avocation. Um, so, what can you tell us, and tell us a little bit about why you wanted to pursue this path? So, uh, my mind's going in a bunch of different directions because one of the things we have to do as practitioner students. The, like the last milestone, the, right, the last rite of passage is go through an oral panel. And I know that's one of the questions I'll probably be asked. So a part of me is like, okay, I have to come up with the right answer now. I'm ready, I'm ready. But, I, uh, <laughs> but actually, we've been thinking about this quite a lot. First of all, I just felt a, a calling for it. Um, I, I wound up uh, retiring from my uh, corporate life in 2019, and I had you know, a lot of people, when, when, when you're entertaining that idea of oh, retirement, what are you going to do? I'm like, believe me, I got lots of ideas of what I want to do. I had, I had two intents. One was I wanted to grow my spiritual life. I mean, I'd been a member of this church since 1995, but I wanted to do more. Uh, because, again, it just speak, it speaks to me, the teaching and everything that I gained from it. Uh, and grow my... And, and in, and reacquaint myself with my creative life. And practitioner training was the way I, I was able to uh, ful fulfill the first intent. And so I felt this calling for it, but the other thing that was a surprise to me as a result of going through the two years of training, plus there's several years of prerequisites you have to do before you go through the two years of training, um, I'm better. I'm a better person. I, I just... I like being in this skin, this human skin, as a result of going through the practitioner training. I'm more generous, I'm more loving, I'm more patient, I'm more giving. I mean, I sound like a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, I don't mean to be facetious, it's true. I'm just, I'm better. So part of it that was a surprise is really selfish. Like, you, you get to be a better you. You get to better, have a better self, capital S, yeah. when you go through it. That's great. So for someone who's never gone to a practitioner, what does a practitioner do? How do, you, how do you describe that? One of the things I say is someone who will know the spiritual truth about you when you don't know it for yourself. And I had a teacher years ago who would call it rent-a-consciousness. Um, because we call this word consciousness, meaning the awareness of God, the consciousness of God, like conscious, awake, and, and seeing it, knowing, experiencing it, and declaring it for other people. That's, that's the long-winded description. So how would you describe it if someone came to you and said, tell me, what, what, is, what do you do? What is that church again? What is, huh? Sure. So I, uh, again, this is in part the training. So you can think of a practitioner like a coach, but what really resonates with me, the, the word that resonates with me is companion. Mm. It's just somebody to you know, walk with you side by side to do what Reverend Sidney said, to remember the truth about you when sometimes we have difficulty remembering that truth about ourselves, when we're down or when we're depressed or when we feel like we have no options or we feel a victim or we feel just deep, deep down despair. 
that, that person that will walk hand in hand with you to remember that truth about yourself. And uh, as you all know, if, uh, as members of this church, as, as, as students like we all are of the science of mind, the uh, spiritual mind treatment, affirmative prayer is so powerful. You know, we, we believe that we can, again, change our destiny. We can create good in our lives, and we can create good in the world. Yeah. And that was like an epiphany, a revelation, a, and a gift in terms of what I've been able to gain as a result of joining this church and now even enhanced further as a result of practitioner training. Wow. Thank you. Is there more? You didn't, tell, you didn't tell me that I was going to be up for this tonight. I know. <laughs> like I said, welcome to your 9-11. My, my whole personal testimony. Um, be your turn next. I know. Absolutely. Well, ask me a question. What do you want to know? Um, I know that um, you, are, you are so educated spiritually, again, um, in many of the thought traditions. And what, what, I, what helped me a lot when I was in the practitioner session last week is I just said, like, what's your spiritual practice? What's your routine? Mm -hmm. And when she shared it with me, I was like, oh, I'm going to steal some of that. Like the way she was able to simplify it and, and things like that. So I would ask you, what's, what is your routine? What's your spiritual practice? I have a lot of curiosity. Um, and so I am a geek about metaphysical interpretation of, of whether it's um, w any wisdom text, and we call the Bible a wisdom text. It's not the only wisdom text. I mean, there are many of them. And I like to look at the, the deeper meaning, the greater meaning involved in that. And that's where I draw my spiritual inspiration and information. Um, when I am looking at the metaphysics involved, or reading an article, or um, seeing stuff happening in the world, my mind wants to go to this level of what is the spiritual information here? What is, what is wanting to be revealed? What is trying to be birthed in this experience? Um, and I talked about a little bit on Sunday, we have these evolutionary triggers and we are, I think that we are living in the midst of that. I really do. Um, so I read a lot, and I really take it in. And, and I also, I mean, I meditate, I pray, I spent years writing out my prayers and what we call a spiritual mind treatment, which means that we, we treat or we look directly at our thinking, whatever has caused us to be feeling what we're feeling or believing what we're believing or experiencing what we're experiencing, we like to go to a deeper place and say, okay, what is the belief that has created this that I have within me? What am I thinking about myself? Am I thinking that I'm not worthy of, of having a loving relationship? Am I thinking somehow because of what someone said years ago that I'm not worthy of having a, a rewarding, fulfilling career or um, all that I need or whatever that particular aspect of life is? And so I, I dive into that stuff pretty headlong um, and I want to know what my own evolutionary triggers are and what my own experiences are. And what I, I noticed something today um, I'm so glad you said, and I'm sorry you were feeling sad, but I'm so glad you acknowledged that, because if you are feeling sad, we're in this collective place where we have once again been triggered and traumatized as, as beings on this planet. And so acknowledge that. You don't have to live in it, nor do you have to identify by it, as it, or through it. But the more we acknowledge it, the less we are trapped by it, and the less we are having to um, deny it, run around it, try to get through it, try to survive, try to struggle through. We can just acknowledge it and say, oh, yeah, that's what's going on. Because, by the way, grief goes sideways. It comes out, and it often will... Well, very quickly, it turns into anger. Fear will turn into anger. Grief will turn into anger because it feels like it's protecting us. 
And I saw this today even with one of our practitioners who was impatient with me, and I saw it with a couple other people, just some stuff that went on. I thought we're all, because we are of one, you know, we are one with all, one with the one, the life, this universe. Yeah, we're going to experience that. And so if you find yourself getting a little bit more snappish than you usually would, or snarky, you know, snarkasm was the word that everybody seemed to like on Sunday, um, you come by it honestly. You don't have to live there, but yeah. I, so do we have a comment from someone, Blair? Yeah. Hello, Reverend Sydney. Um, yeah, I'm monitoring Facebook and Zoom, and we've got a couple questions. I'm going to paraphrase and merge okay. a couple questions because, but you've addressed them somewhat. Um, and I guess the big one that we all ask ourselves in this question, in this situation, is where is God in this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's such a horrible thing. Where is God in that that event? And then an another question of waiting to prepare us a place to heal, starting with ourselves. And I think that's partially an answer to the question. Um, so, Mark, I think you're ready for where is God in all this? <laughs> that's an easy one, right? We know that God is in every, every aspect, every experience. God didn't create this. This is people who are disconnected from their God selves who are creating this. And so, where is God in this? God is in our compassion for the families, for the people who have lost their lives, for the army of people who are coming to their rescue to support the communities and those families. That's where God is. God is in, perhaps, creation of some political will in our country that perhaps we will finally take on some aspect of gun control to prevent this from happening again in the future. But God is there. But God didn't, again, God didn't create any of that. God didn't create any of this. God is with us as we go through our journey to process and to deal with this and perhaps become activists. Maybe there are several people in this room will uh, start to write letters to their senators or senators in other states and who knows, but that's where God is. Mm -hmm. That's where God is. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, God is in the response that we have. God is in the love that we show. God is in the anger that we have. God is in all of it. Um, not separate from us, but God as an individual or a personality coming down from the heavens and rescuing us is not going to happen. And as we live according to that idea and desire, then we stay powerless and we stay victims. Yet we have so much ability and so much power to show up as as divine loving beings who hold compassion, who hold space. You know, Mr. Rogers used to say, look for the helpers in situations like that. I thought of that as you were speaking. That we, and sometimes all we can do is just, as you said, companion someone, just be present, just be present. And it's in that, that uh, a space of love and possibility begins to emerge. It begins to emerge. Do you feel like that addresses what was asked? Look for the helpers. I love that. Always yeah. one of the sayings I loved. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. And Mark, just take that speech into your uh, boards, <laughs> and I, I think you're, you're going to be just fine. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have something for, I didn't even tell him I was going to ask him to read this. Have you all heard of Clarissa Pencola Estes, Women Who Run With the Wolves? Um, and she wrote this thing, and I'm going to, and so this is how this tonight went. I walked in and said, I don't know what I'm doing, but be ready for anything. Um, so I have this for you to read, and I'm sure you've read it before. And he, he's an actor. He knows how to do a cold read. Um, and also, and I asked permission from Sam, and he said, yes, go ahead. Um, it's, so that's going to set up a song that I'm going to sing that, again, I pulled out my file. I'm sorry that I have a file for stuff like this, but apparently I do. 
because we are in the midst of, of birthing something. You know, the gestation, the birth, and birth is messy. It's very messy. So here we are midwifing each other into a higher level of, of just being loving. So go for it. If you want to stand, you should. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Okay. I'll get better uh, breath support that way. Yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> My friends, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I've heard from so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They're concerned about the state of affairs in our world now. Ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradations of what matters most to civilized visionary people. You're right in your assessments the luster and the hubris some have aspired to while endorsing acts so heinous against children, elders, everyday people, the poor, the unguarded, the helpless, it's breathtaking. Yet I urge you, I ask you, gentle you, to please not spend your spirit dry by bewailing these difficult times. Especially, do not lose hope most particularly because the fact is that we were made for these times. Yes, yes, for years. We have been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. I grew up on the Great Lakes, and I recognize a, seaworth a seaworthy vessel when I see one. Regarding awakened souls, there have, there have never been more able vessels in the water than there are right now across the world. And they are fully provisioned, and they are able to signal one another as never before in the history of humankind. Look out over the prow. There are millions of boats of righteous souls on the waters with you. Even though your veneers may shiver from every wave in this stormy royal, I assure you that the long timbers composing your prow and rudder come from a greater forest. That long-grained lumber is known to withstand storms, to hold together, to hold its own, and to advance regardless. In any dark time, there is a tendency to veer toward fainting over how much is wrong or unmended in the world. Do not focus on that. There's a tendency, too, to fail, to, to fall into being weakened by dwelling on what is outside your reach, by what you cannot yet be. Don't focus there. That's spending the wind without raising the sails. We are needed. That is all that I know. And though we meet resistance, we more so will meet great souls who will hail us, love us, guide us, and we will know them when they appear. Didn't you say you were a believer? Didn't you say you pledged to listen to a voice greater? Didn't you ask for grace? Don't you remember that to be in grace means to submit to the voice greater? Ours is not the task of fixing the entire world all at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Any small, calm thing that one soul can do to help another soul, to assist some portion of this suffering world, will help immensely. It is not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip toward an enduring good. What is needed for dramatic change is an accumulation of acts, adding, adding to, adding more, continuing. We know that it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small, determined group who will not give up during the first, second, or hundredth gale. One of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Soul on deck shines like gold in dark times. The light of the soul throws sparks, can send up flares, build signal fires, causes proper matters to catch fire, to display the lantern of soul in shadow, shadowy times like these, to be fierce and to show mercy towards others. Both are acts of immense bravery and greatest necessity. 
Struggling souls catch light from other souls who are fully lit and willing to show it. If you would help to calm the tumult, this is one of the strongest things that you can do. There will always be times when you feel discouraged. I too have felt despair many times in my life, but I do not keep a chair for it. I will not entertain it. It's not allowed to eat from my plate. The reason is this. In my uttermost bones, I know something, as do you. It is that there can be no despair when you remember why you came to earth, who you serve, and who sent you here. The good words we say and the good deeds we do are not ours. They are the words and deeds of the one who brought us here. In that spirit, I will hope you will write this on your wall. When a great ship is in harbor and moored, it is safe. There can be no doubt. But that is not what great ships are built for. Wow. <laughs> I can hear such sadness in the voices of my friends Talking about this world and its pain But we must not lose heart and we cannot give up hope For long have we journeyed waiting for this day these times, these times, these times seem so uncertain, so unkind. But this path makes us stronger the higher we climb. We were made for these times. Let us turn to courage and faith, our greed to generosity. We can give our anger to love's compassion and move this injustice toward peace and unity. These times, these times, these times seem so uncertain, so unkind. But this path makes us stronger the higher we climb. We were made for these times. Didn't we say we are? Remember, right now we are needed to stand and shine a light in this hour, in this place. These times, these times, these times seem so uncertain, so unkind.
okay, what are we doing now? <laughs> and we're melding the service into something else now. Um, we're going to pray. Who would have thought? So you have a seat. I'll go over there. And I just want to find a little bit of Dalai Lama. All right. So I'm just going to invite everyone to turn within and recognizing the infinite power and presence of God which has created and sustained universes seen and unseen is that infinite intelligence that loving wisdom which keeps the planes in their the, the, the planets in their orbits which keeps the oceans rising and falling, which keeps birds being born, which keeps the grass growing, which keeps all life in a perpetual expression of beauty, of possibility, of new life. And we are that. We are here by means of that. We are here as that. We are here as the divine in expression. How wonderful to know that each of us are connected not just with and as God, but with each other. We are one with each other. We are one with life. We are one with this universe. We are one with the one. And as such, I know that we are now willing to acknowledge the pain, to acknowledge the vulnerability, to acknowledge all of it, and to know that with that, we rise even higher. Because together we rise, together we heal, together we love, together we grow, together we are able to envision and therefore walk into that vision a world of peace, a country of harmony, of possibility, where children are safe, where parents know that their children are safe. We know that this is the vision, and so we choose now to live into that vision. We live into that vision by listening to that divine voice within that says, ah, my child, you are so beloved. This is what I have for you to do. Walk this path and bless the people around you and lift them up. So I know for all of us that we live from that wholeness. We live from that love. We live from that awareness. And we stay open to it. We stay vulnerable. We honor that which we go through. And we bless it. All of it. And I know that in that is our strength. In that is our resilience. In that is our ability, our capacity to recognize that there is only one power, one presence, one mind, God the good omnipotent. And we are here as franchises of that to express that. So I know that as we leave this place, we know that we have been blessed, that this church is blessed, that all churches are blessed, all mosques, all temples, all synagogues, all ashrams, all places where people gather, we know that love is being expressed. We know that life is being expressed. So we choose to know that we are, we are here for a great purpose. We are here for a great purpose. We were made for these times. Therefore, we are beyond equal to these times. We are blessed by and in these times. And together we rise and move through these times in glory. So I know that for each of us, we say yes, yes, yes. We accept this charge and we do so with gratitude and with anticipation, moving into the world, knowing that right where we are, God is, and yes, all is well. And so it is, and together we say amen. Struggle, no more struggle.
right, thank you. So right now, thank you. This is when we accept your tithes, your love offerings, your gifts, and we are grateful for them because it allows us to carry this message and not just support you, but to support this planet. So I invite you to take your offering and to hold it in your hand. Take it, hold it to your heart. Even if it's the idea of that, I know I give my offering online automatically, but let's just say this together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. And so it is. I have some announcements. We make it easy for you to make donations to our church. The text to give number is inside the program for those of you that are here with us, and a QR code is on the back. Or for everybody here or those uh, attending virtually, you can go to nhcrs.org forward slash give. A prayer with a practitioner is available after service in person and on Zoom. Next Wednesday, Wednesday evening service with Reverend Sidney Steen. Meditation again at 6.50, service at 7 p.m. Join Reverend Sidney next week as she shares on the topic, sounds pretty provocative, 50 Shades of God. <laughs> uh, Japan trip with Dr. Mark. Uh, this, this year, October 2022. Join Dr. Mark for the spiritual adventure of a lifetime. For details and to sign up, visit the website today, nhcrs.org. Don't miss this, we have a new class. A remarkable Dr. Mark is presenting a remarkable six-week class based on the teachings of a remarkable woman. Emma Curtis Hopkins was and is one of the most profound new thought icons. Her book, Scientific Christian Mental Practice, establishes an absolute and powerful foundation for healing and wholeness in every area of your life. Join Dr. Mark for the class, Scientific Christian Mental Practices, Part 1. It'll be on Mondays beginning June 6th, and it'll run 6.30 to 8 p.m., and it'll only be on Zoom. The cost is $150. Sign up on the patio or online. Get the book in our bookstore or online. And personally, I've taken this class. It is life-changing. Love, Emma Curtis Hopkins. Please join us for our 2022 Memorial Day Sunday celebration. This Sunday, May 29th, at our 11.30 a.m. service, offered in person and on Zoom. Ah. Just one time only. Okay, gotcha. So again, this is, this is unusual. We normally just broadcast the first service, but this Sunday we'll do the broadcast at the second. Excellent. And so listen to this, what you're, what's in store for you this Sunday. We will remember 
invite all of the members to recommit. We will renew, invite practitioners to recommit, rewire, install Reverend Dr. Sidney Lehmanstein as our assistant minister, and then refire afterwards with a delicious barbecue and party for the whole family. So don't miss it. Um, if you or a loved one could use some enhanced spiritual support, we have a pastoral care team ready to help. Pre please reach out to our team through the website, nhcrs.org. Uh, our standard Zoom virtual patio is before and after Sunday and Wednesday services, and there is a Zoom meditation Monday through Saturday mornings from 7.55 to 8.15 a.m. Talk about jump-starting your day. That is a wonderful way to do it. Visit our website, nhcrs.org, to obtain Zoom links and more information about all of our events and to sign up for the weekly e-blasts and monthly newsletters. Yes. Hey, you did great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So I just want to say, I just want to say that um, a number of people have come up to me and to Dr. Mark and said, scientific Christian? And it, so if you find yourselves a little triggered by the word Christian, understand that that's not what this is. That Emma Curtis Hopkins wrote and taught, she taught Ernest Holmes, she taught Charles Fillmore who founded Unity, she taught all of the people that we are, are, are studying still today with her ideas about the Christ within, the light within. Christ was not Jesus' last name. It meant anointed, aware. It meant awake. So if you want to be awake and anointed and aware, no, you're not going to suddenly become a Christian unless you want to be whatever you want to be. Ernest Holmes wrote the textbook and founded this teaching so people could go back to their churches and synagogues and mosques and be better, stronger in their beliefs, whatever they were. So um, I hope that you'll sign up for the class. It's going to be great. I'm taking it, and I'm fun. Okay, so... <laughs> So let's just, um, we're going to pray out, and we have coffee, and I think I saw apple pie, so, all right. So we just take this moment once again to celebrate in gratitude that we have come together, we have come together in love, and that we celebrate this life, and we know that right where we are, God is, and we move into a greater knowing of peace, of joy. And we are forever blessed by this experience. I know that we are each, as we move into the world, guided and guarded and open-hearted. And indeed, we just simply look at each other with love ah, and say, and so it is, amen. Thank you very much. Thank you.